This is Banff Center Talks from the Banff Center in Alberta. I'm Eleanor Wachtel in conversation with author Salman Rushdie. Uh, the last time we met was also in Alberta, it was in Edmonton, but the first time we met, I'm going back, and it was in the fall of 1988 when India banned the, the Satanic Verses. Yeah. And the second time was when you made a surprise visit to Toronto uh, uh, because of Penn, to, to appear at Penn. And in advance, this is obviously after the fatwa and during the period of the fatwa, and um, I wasn't told where I was going or how, all I knew was to prepare to interview you, but I didn't know where it was. And I, I, in fact- Nor I, did I. Nor, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a but great- Basically, we've been talking to each other for a quarter of a century. <laughs> you know, so, as we were saying. As a, <laughs> <laughs> When you were asked what book made you what you are today, you said The Thousand and One Nights. Why? I, mean, I suppose because these were the stories I grew up with, you know, so long before. I mean, the book is not a children's book. You know, the book is, is a very adult book. It's certainly not written in language that children would read. But I mean, I first heard these stories, stories of gin and so on from, from my parents as bedtime stories. And then you grow up a little bit and you read them as picture books and comic books and so on, and you eventually graduate to the real books. But it's just, and it's not only The Thousand and One Nights. I mean, I was obliged in that questionnaire to choose one book. But in, in India, there's a there's this very large number of compendiums of these kind of wonder tales. In fact, there's one in, from Kashmir, uh, which in Sanskrit is called the Kathasarit Saga, which means the ocean of the streams of story, from which I got the idea for another book. Um, but that's actually even longer than the Arabian Nights. Um, and has, I mean, it doesn't have the magical frame story of Shahrazad, but it has a lot of really extraordinary stories. So I grew up with that and the animal fables of the Panchatantra and, you know, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata and the, um, the Hamza Nama. There's any number of these things. So you grow up surrounded by fantastic tales, you know, and for me, I mean, that made, that made that kind of writing feel normal. You know, realism showed up later uh, and seemed inferior. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see the fascination with these tales as a child, especially when told by your parents, but how did it become so meaningful to you as an adult? Well, because I mean, I'm interested in folktale and myth and so on, because I think what happens in, in the stories that last you know, thousands of years is that they, they compress meaning. You know, they, they contain an enormous amount of meaning in a very short space. And so you can unpack them and all sorts of stuff comes out. You know, and if you, I would just use a Western example because of, I wrote a novel in part inspired by the myth of Orpheus. If you would take the myth of Orpheus in Eurydice, you can tell the whole story in 100 words or less, you know, maybe 50 words. And yet it contains incredible resonant power when you start looking at it, because it contains this, uh, this great fable about love, art, and death. And you can look at it optimistically and you can say that it means that love through the agency of art is able to pass beyond the gates of death. Or you can look at it pessimistically and say that death, in spite of the power of art, destroys love. And all of it's true. You know, the great thing about myths is there's no one meaning. You can turn them round and round and round and find many things in them. And so it's always fascinated me because this is the... You know, this is the imaginative storehouse of the human race, this, 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 kind of, this kind of storehouse of stories. And so I go back to them all the time. Your new novel, Two Years, Eight Months, and 28 Nights, the title adds up to 1,001 Nights. And that number shows up at various points through the book. But your central character isn't Scheherazade, but Dunya, a kind of jinya, or what we've known as genies. Yeah. Tell me about them. What are the jinn? <laughs> Well, the jinn are very ancient. I mean, in the literature, they're very ancient. I mean, they're, they're 
older than, I mean, although there are, there's quite a lot of stories about the jinn in, in Islamic culture, but they're actually pre-Islamic, they're much older than that. And they are, you know, they're, they're, they're metamorphic, powerful beings. Some of, them, some of them are very powerful, some of them are very minor. You know, um, and they're not interested, what I liked about them is they're not interested in religion just as I'm not. <laughs> uh, uh, they, they strongly suspect that God is just a story, you know, um, in the way that we think that the jinn are just a story, you know. Um, so they, they're pagan, you know, they're, and they're also, in a way, it's wrong to call them good or evil. They're, they're people who are creatures who are not interested in the idea of good and evil, or right and wrong. They're amoral. Um, and that makes them dangerous in a way, because when they show up amongst us, what is in their nature to do is to screw things up. <laughs> and so that's what they do. Well, or, and sometimes they're under orders to screw things up. For instance, if they grant wishes and yes, the person is telling them what to do. Yeah, I mean, this is what we all know about the gin. We know about lamps and bottles, you know. And nobody ever explains how they got in there, you know. <laughs> And? Very, very difficult to get a gin into a bottle or, or uh, uh, You have to be really quite clever. And it, we're not never told. You know, in the story of Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp, we know that the, come, the gin comes out of the bottle, but we don't know who put him in there, out of the lamp, but we don't know who put him in there. There actually is a wonderful story that was sort of novella that A.S. Byatt wrote. Um, called The Jinn in the Nightingale's Eye. Um, and Nightingale's Eye is the translation of the uh, Persian Arabic phrase, chashme bulbul, which means, literally means the night, eye of the nightingale, but it's the name of a color of glass. It's a blue glass. And so the jinn is in a blue glass bottle, like the jinn in, in this book. But, you know, very powerful sorcery is required to get them in. Once you've got them in, yes, then, then they're required to help you if you let them out. What kinds of stories about the jinn did you hear about when you were growing up? Oh, well, scary stories. Scary stories. This is my parents scaring me into sleep, you know. <laughs> <laughs> was it like boogeyman kind of yes, thing? Yes, yes, they were, yeah. And I mean, you know, the thing is, even now, even today in India, people will refer colloquially to the jinn as being responsible for mishaps and, you know, they drop a glass, you know, a jinn made them do it. You know, um, if there's a car accident, you know, people, people do constantly use the metaphor of the jinn still in everyday speech to refer to bad things that happen. Even though they're, as you describe them, their behavior is, is kind of arbitrary and yeah. purposeless and, very, and they they're... end up in bottles because they're kind of lazy or... Yes, they're indolent. <laughs> um, they suffer from ADD. <laughs> um, and really the only thing that they know how to do all the time is to have sex. That's what they do non-stop for, for, for millennia. And you know, after hundreds of thousands of years of having sex, it's a little dull. <laughs> so that's, that's why they get interested in humankind. Yes, yeah, so they, they're interested, they, what they rather, what they, they're very reluctant to admit it, the gym, but what they're grudgingly obliged to admit is that they're interested in human beings because we are more interesting than them. Because we do a lot of things other than have sex. And actually, most of us don't really have sex at all. Really. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> so we have all this time to do other stuff. <laughs> in, in your novel, Dunya, a, a princess of the jinn, falls in love with human being and before we talk about who her beloved is, tell me a bit more about her. What does it mean to be a jinn princess? Well, you know, she really, she's the heart of the book in many ways. I mean, she's, I mean, yes, she's the most important female character, but she's kind of the heart of the book because it's her love for human beings that makes, sets her apart from the jinn. You know, uh, the jinn are not good at love. You know, they're good at lust and so on, but they're, they're not good at love. And she is. And so she's a very unusual figure, even amongst her own people. You know? um, and her love for the human being, race means that she ends up, hundreds of years ago, like in the 12th century, she has this love affair 
and produces spectacular numbers of children. And, and their descendants you know, multiply and travel around the world. And, and then the novel leaps 900 years or so to the present day. But just to go back for a second, to be a gin princess. Oh. I mean, I didn't even know there was like royalty and, and yeah, the gin royalty. line. You no, know? there's royalty. Yeah, there's always royalty. <laughs> 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 and and she, is, she, is very, she is very, very powerful. I did something about the great, there, there, are, there are very few of the gin. I mean, this is, I'm not, I'm partly, partly this is my fiction, but also it, it exists in the stories of the gin. That, most of the jinn are rather kind of simple creatures who can do little nasty things, but there are the, there are the grand jinn, the grand ifrits, you know, who are either dark or light, you know, and, and they have immense powers. And she is a female version of that, and, and her particular power is over lightning. She's known as the lightning princess because she has immense power over the thunderbolt. And so, it turns out, so do some of her partly human, her partly gin, mostly human descendants. So there's a lot of lightning bolts in this book. <laughs> well, one of the things that I found interesting about uh, Dunya is that unlike Scheherazade, she's a listener rather than yes, a storyteller. Yes. I didn't want I didn't want to have a Scheherazade figure in the book, you know, because we already have Scheherazade, you know, and she's one of the greatest figures in the history of literature. And I thought, don't don't try and copy that. You know, leave that alone. Um, yes, but she is one of the gifts of the jinn, of the great jinn, is, is to be able to listen. They can put their ear, because they can make themselves invisible, they can do all kinds of things. So, so they can come up to you and place their ear against your heart, and they can hear your heart's desire. You know? and, and then if they feel like it, they can do something about that. Now, the human being that Dunya falls in love with is, is based on a real-life 12th century philosopher, Ibn Rushd. Yes. Who was he? Well, known in the West as Averroes, he's, a, he's one of the great Aristotelian philosophers. His, his commentaries on Aristotle became colossally influential in European philosophy. I mean, they, were, they were enormously influential on, on Thomas Aquinas and, and also even on the, the Florentine uh, Renaissance humanist philosophers. So, so he's a major figure in the history of philosophy. He lived in Cordova, which is the capital of Moorish Spain, uh, towards the end of the 12th century. And he was, in his time, a very progressive voice. I mean, like the tradition of, the, there's a tradition of Aristotelian philosophers in Arab, Moorish Arab thought, but he's sort of the last and greatest of them. And they believed in trying to shift uh, the thought of the Arab world away from blind faith and towards the use of reason and logic and science. So he was a, you know, he was a progressive thinker and he fell foul of conservative factions in his time. There was a moment when he was exiled and his books got burned. I thought, you know. <laughs> There's a story here. What a, I think, <laughs> But what a coincidence, I thought. <laughs> you know? but, but it's more than coincidence, because your own family name has yeah. a, a close connection with it. Yeah, my father thing. admired his thought and, and changed our family name to Rushdie as a kind of, in his, my grandfather wasn't called Rushdie, you know. Um, but it seemed it's a very significant move to do that. I mean, to change a family name. Yeah. You can admire someone without yeah. adopting yeah. their name. Do you, do you understand? Well, I mean, I, you know, I wasn't there when he did it. Uh, but, um, and in fact, I didn't find out about it. I mean, I assumed that was our name and that was our, the end, you know. But as I grew older, I was, he and my mother told me this, this story. And, and then, yeah, of course, I thought it's a very major thing to do, you know, to name yourself after somebody. So I became very interested in, in the thought of Averroes, Ibn Rushd. And, and when I was at college studying history, I, I, I started reading his stuff, and, and I found him very attractive as a thinker too, you know, at the time. And I, I sort of got it, I saw what my father saw in him, you know. And, but then, I mean, the strange thing is that when the attack on my work began, to discover that his work had been, and he had been attacked in a very similar way, you know, that was kind of spooky, that that, uh, that, 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 that um, echo mm -hmm. down the centuries, you know, happened. And so it made, I mean, it just made him a very interesting character to me for obvious reasons. 
And did your father's father mind that your father took, you know, changed his name? I, I don't know that. I think my father's father died quite young when my father was still quite young. So I think this happened Afterwards. after that. So I don't think my grandfather was asked. <laughs> Now, part of Ibn Rushd's philosophy was in response to another philosopher, Ghazali, who died in 1111, which is 15 years before Rushd was born. And you said earlier that one of the things that appealed to you about the jinn was that they weren't interested in religion, but yet you recreated a religious argument, in a, in a sense, yeah. at the center of your book. You recreate their argument across the, a yes. century in your novel. It's so interesting, though, the argument, because it's the... Uh, Ghazali was... Actually, he's an interesting figure because at one point in his life, he had a crisis of faith, more or less completely lost his belief. And, and then when he regained it, he became ultra-doctrinaire um, in the kind of zeal of the convert, the zeal of the reconvert. convert you know. Um, and he wrote this famous book called The Incoherence of the Philosophers, in which he denounced philosophy as failing to understand the true majesty of God, etc. And... Ibn Rushd, 80 years later, wrote a reply to it with the wonderful title of The Incoherence of the Incoherence. Um, and I, I almost called this novel that. And then I thought, you know, that's like giving your enemies the weapon to hit you with. <laughs> if you have incoherence in the title of your book, it's like encouraging everybody to say that about the book. You know, so I thought, not born yesterday, not doing that. <laughs> but, you know, it, that argument between... It's an argument about the nature of God, basically. The, 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 the image that's used in the novel of the, bo the ball of cotton and the flame is actually used in, in the philosophy of Ghazali. He asks, you know, what happens if you bring a flame into contact with a ball of cotton? What happens? Cotton catches fire, right? Why does a cotton catch fire? Now, the rationalist would say it's because once God has made the laws of the universe, the laws of the universe apply. And one of the laws of the universe is that a hot flame will set fire to cotton. So it's just, that's how it is. That's, that's science. And, and Ghazali would say that's incorrect because to say that is to diminish the power of God. And in fact, the reason why the flame burns the cotton is because at that particular moment, God agrees that it's okay for the flame to burn the cotton. But if God wanted the cotton to extinguish the flame, he could do that because he's God. And when this argument is offered to the jinn princess in the novel, she says, that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but Which that's the nature of the argument. But why use their argument in particular to illustrate the debate between faith and reason, between Ghazali and Rushd? In, well, it in, just in grew, you know, and actually, originally, they were only supposed to appear in this little prologue, this, this 12th century prologue to the main action, in the, the, this section in which Ibn Rushd is in the first place, having this love affair with, with this woman that he doesn't know, is a supernatural being, except that she is capable of producing 19 children at a time. That should have given him a clue. <laughs> he's a philosopher. He's a philosopher. <laughs> and and he's, also, he's also just a little bit self-absorbed. <laughs> um, um, and, and to that and, and this, his, his philosophy, his uh, philosophy about reason and science so on, was, was what I thought they'd be. And then I thought we'd jump 900 years and have the novel. But once I had this idea of starting this, this sort of surreal argument, because of course they never really met because they were both apart distant in time and space, you know. Um, but once I got them arguing with each other, I, it was kind of too enjoyable to just dump it, you know. So I thought I have to find a way of letting them continue the argument at various points in the book, even though they've been dead for a thousand years. And so they do. They're kind of they're ghosts, you know. The the dust in their graves argues with other dust, you know. This is this is what we call fiction. <laughs> <laughs> they really do. I mean, the dust really do, does. Yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, so it just became. I I really hadn't in, in my original plan yeah. for the novel. I hadn't intended them to be recurring characters in the book, but they they insisted on it. <laughs> 